Hi everyone, welcome back to the workshop and part two of the HP 3245A Universal Source upgrade and modification video. Now in the part one video you saw me replace the non-volatile RAMs, the battery backed non-volatile RAMs with a couple of FRAM ICs. That's working great. You also saw me recap the power supply and this main board here and also I retrofitted some of the op amps around the voltage reference, the LM399 with my own dip to SO adapters so that I could fit my own surface mount ICs. Now in this video I'm actually going to take a look at the front panel here. Um, in part one video you would have seen that there was a problem with the VFD. So if I just switch it on now we can take another look. Okay here we go. You can see there's a row of pixels as it were right through from one side right through to the other side which are not working. And to tell you the truth it's not going to be a problem with the drive, it's going to be a problem with the actual VFD itself. These things do age and they do go dim and they do go faulty. And this one's a little bit dim, it's certainly not as bright as a new one, which is actually what I'm going to fit. I managed to pick up from China, so this is obviously a reproduction item, it's not from HP. And this one's actually a replacement VFD for a 3458A multimeter. But in actual fact, the 3245A shares exactly the same VFD. Now, I do actually have a couple of these, so I can afford to put one of them into the 3245A. Now, on camera, the front panel looks okay, but in real life, it's pretty messed up, it's pretty dull, and it's broken along the bottom and I really like my instruments to be in perfect shape as new. So it just so happens I managed to pick up on eBay a brand new, I don't know if it's reproduction or not, but anyway it's a brand new front panel for the 3245A and also a new rubbers for the actual keypad. So let's get this one stripped down and let's fix the new VFD and the new front panel etc. Again on camera you don't really see this but the on off switch is rather yellowed with age. So I'm actually going to try and do something about that. I'm going to try and brighten this switch up a bit. Okay that's the front panel removed. Now I can start stripping it down. As you can see the display board in the back there with its ribbon cable. So let's get the PCB out first of all. One screw removed and it should just lift out, I think. And there we go. And <laughs> wow, look at the dirt and all the rest of it inside the back of that uh, smoke screen there. Wow. In fact, all that's come from shavings and etc. from the front panel. There's obviously been a bit of a misfit down here and all the residue from that there has just coated the inside of that screen there. Wow. No worries, got a new one to fit. Now as I said, I'm quite confident the problem actually lies with the VFD in terms of that missing line. So I'm just going to go ahead and replace it. To actually troubleshoot it, the components are actually underneath the two driver chips are actually underneath the VFD and there's not really much to it. There's not much more electronics involved. Apart from these passives over here and looks like we've got a transistor or something there. So I'm just going to go ahead and remove it now. 
But before I actually replace the VFT, I'm actually going to take a look at the uh, actual power on off switch and let's see if we can do something about this yellowing. Because I will need to leave this for an hour or two as the solution I'm going to put it into works its magic. And I'm actually going to use some hydrogen peroxide. Now I have seen online that you're supposed to use something like 30% or 10%. I've only got 3% so not really sure how well that'll work. but. Maybe I can just uh, leave it in the sunlight outside for a little bit longer. So the idea is to pour some into here, then I'll just pop this into here and leave it in the solution. Okay, let's get the VFD removed. Right, let's see if it'll lift out. There's a couple of guides down the sides. Don't need to remove them. They shouldn't get in the way of removing the VFD at this point anyway. And there it is. Pulled straight out, no problems. And wow, look at that. It's actually damaged to here, the back of the glass there. I wonder if that's got something to do with that uh, row of missing pixels. Although I'm not sure because I think this is the actual column drive for each one of the characters by the looks of it. Looking through the back there, you can see the lines coming down onto the p single pads above each character. So, mm, not so sure about that. In actual fact, the missing piece of glass was sitting just below the VFD so it obviously had a crack before and possibly those end pins there have got something to do with that missing row there so wow I mean it came out really really easily so it's not like I had to force it or anything like that so yeah wow and taking a look at the new VFD, the replacement one, looks like I will need to remove those guardrails here because the new one is a little bit wider. And I've come across this before when I've replaced these VFDs that, uh, yeah, they're not quite as slim in that direction as the original ones. So I'll go ahead and remove those guardrails right now. And there we go, there's the VFD removed from the circuit board. And everything underneath it looks perfect. The two driver chips there, no problem at all. So I'll offer up the new one and let's see if we can get it fitted. Now as it came to me, the pins are all over the place in this thing here. So I only need to do a little bit of straightening up of them. Uh, trying to make them align with the holes. It can be a challenge given there's so many of them and they're actually quite long and really easily bent. And of course we do want to get it the right way round. Now what you will need to do as I've done here is because of the wider VFD these pins here need to be relatively flat against the glass to stop them interfering with uh, some plastic that runs along here on the actual front panel so make sure you flatten them down there's a couple of ways of doing it uh, my preferred way of doing it is don't try to bend them flat before you fit the VFD to the front panel fit the VFD then pull the pins through from the hole very lightly and you'll find that the pins themselves flatten down quite nicely enough that it clears the plastic there if you don't do that you won't be able to fit the front panel PCB to the actual front panel itself well that's the pins in their holes four corner one soldered and I've aligned it so I just need to run along with the soldering iron and solder them all in place and then I'll actually test it just to make sure it's okay before I assemble the new front panel okay here we go ready for the switch on it will be upside down and I've turned the workshop lights off just so it's a little bit brighter and yes perfect nice and bright and importantly that row that was missing before is now fully functional. Perfect.
So here is the new front panel and the first thing you need to do is fit the new rubber push button membranes. Now there isn't a lot of difference between the old one and the new one. If I can put them side by side, they're just a little bit cleaner. The old ones are actually not too bad, but I'm just going to fit the new ones just because I have them. So first things first, let's split them up. They're obviously molded in one unit. There we go. And I'll fit them in place. And of course, trying to get them the right way up. Now I'll put the PCB in place. Now, I haven't actually refitted these two guards and well they might be required because if you look at the PCB they are actually I presume it's a ground they are actually grounded and if I don't fit them then perhaps this one here is not going to be grounded to the other two perhaps the other ends or indeed this one right across that one but measuring the PCB with my meter they are actually connected so technically I might not need these but in order to make sure we we'll get a nice low resistance between them I might need to refit them but obviously they won't fit in the front because of the wider VFD so I think I might be able to fit them to the back if there's room behind the front panel which I think there is now I do actually have a new smoke screen for the 3245A but I don't need to fit it until the very end because it snaps in from the front. And actually I'll just give it another test now that I've got the keypad fitted etc and it's all working great and it's really nice and bright with the smoke glass fitted. Perfect. One other thing I do need to remove from the old front panel is these three blanking plugs here for the channel B option which my 3245A doesn't have. Maybe that's something I can upgrade to in the future. Three. I'll get them fitted. And that's it fitted. Now I'm ready to offer up the front panel to the chassis. Well, there we go, that's it all back together, apart from the power switch, because it does take a few hours in the sun to brighten up those plastics. Hopefully it'll work with 3% hydrogen peroxide, but yet to be seen. But anyway, this is it all up and running again. Everything seems to be working. All three keypads, perfect. Out of interest, as part of the kit with the front panel, I did actually get a rear panel sticker here. Uh, but the one that's fitted is actually like new, so I'm not going to bother with this one, so I'll just keep it aside. Well, there we go. It's definitely whiter, uh, but I do need to do it a bit more, I think. It's a bit cloudy today, so I'm not sure if that's uh, inhibiting the uh, UV rays, I'm not sure. But I'll uh, put it back in the 3245A for the time being, and I'll give it a go another day when it's a bit more sunny. Okay, there's the 3245A fitted to my stack. That's the original 3245A and my 3458A at the bottom. And what I'm doing right now is I'm setting up to run a week long soak in test on the 3245A to hopefully get the output as stable etc as it can be because they actually want to make an initial test on the unit and that is to see what sort of temperature drift the output has. And the reason for that is, on my original 3245A, I do notice that it's actually quite susceptible to variance in its output relative to workshop temperature. And I'm not sure, I haven't looked at the spec for the 3245A, I'm not sure if 
it's out of spec or if it's within spec and I'd initially like to test the new 3245A to see if it's anything like the original one. Now one thing to note, the original 3245A doesn't have an LM399 voltage reference in it. It's actually been upgraded to an ADR1399, the successor to the LM399. So it's actually a little bit better spec. So the new 3245A is still fitted with the original LM399. And that's about the only differences, apart from those other op-amp modifications that I'd made to this one. So right now I'm going to go and calibrate both 3245As and then from that point onwards I can run it overnight, check what the output is in the morning on the 3458A. Okay, it's the next morning and the temperature, first thing in the morning, is 22 degrees in the workshop. So that's a drop of 2.1 degrees. And you can see on my original 3245A, I've just run an ACAL DCV, a recalibration of 3458A. And you can see what the voltage reading is now. It's dropped quite significantly. 6 microvolts or something like that. So let's try my new one. And let it settle and it's gone up by just under two microvolts that's quite a difference between the two 3245As but I'm not going to do any more analysis on that I did suspect that this one here was drifting a little bit more than it should be but whether that's out of spec for a 3245 I don't know I haven't looked up the data sheet yet but that'll be for another video where I've got much more extensive testing to do especially in relation to the op-amp modifications that I'd made to my new 3245A so thanks for watching and don't forget to like and subscribe it really does help the channel grow and if you want to help me more directly then you can donate via paypal or patreon in the links below plenty more repair videos on my channel check them out and thanks for watching